tonight, for no reason other than I just feel led to, I'm going to let Cheeseburger preach the message tonight. No? All right. I'm going to go back over John 17, 11. For some reason, I just feel like uh, walking through this again, uh, and, and I'll probably, I don't know, I don't know why, but I've, I've got, I've been studying some things, getting ready for homecoming. And um, some pretty, I used the word yesterday, um, and I can't remember what the word was now, I used yesterday. Ex explosive um, things that have come out recently. Okay, bombshell, that's the word I used. Bombshell revelations that have come out in the past seven to eight days and it just it just so happens and I don't believe in accidents that what has what has come to the surface and what has been made public now is something that God showed me in this King James Bible Probably some 15 years ago, or maybe beyond that. I was trying, telling John about it, and I was trying to remember how far back uh, a, a particular study. I don't want to blow it. I don't want to say what it is yet. I'm going to make you, make you show up for it. But um, it's probably been between 15 and 20 years ago that God led me down this little study. And I was like, whoa, this is absolutely amazing. But not really having an idea of just how real it could be. Uh, but I will give you a hint. Things that I have preached for the last 15 years were testified before Congress in the past eight days. Okay? And um, you, I, I, when I listened to it Monday, I, I came in Monday morning, I, and I, for some reason, that was, I guess the Holy Ghost wanted me to see it. It was pulled up on my YouTube feed, and I hit the play button at just the right time, and this guy was coming out with something. I'm going, no way did he say that. So, uh, I promise you, if the Lord, if the Lord uh, tarries his coming, then I will present it to you this weekend. If he comes to get us before then, he can do it. In fact, I'd rather him do it this weekend too. Amen? Amen. John chapter 17, verse 11. Uh, it's good to have Don uh, from uh, just, just somewhere around the Fort, uh, Fort, I won't say Fort Smith, that's in Arkansas. Fort Worth. Yeah, there you go. Uh, Fort Worth area. I told him, I said, if he, st if he starts looking up every now and then, he can see Kenneth Copeland's jet fly overhead <clears throat> with Copeland flying it himself. Uh, anyway, uh, don't be jealous of people like that. Amen. Don't be jealous of rich people. One of these days, you're going to have more than they could have ever possibly dreamed of. Amen. Amen. Father, we thank you, Lord, for bringing us into your house tonight. I thank you, God, for uh, ministering to your people today and ministering to me. And Lord, I just thank you, God, for the blessing of your word and the, and the testimony, Lord, that is in it. And Lord, when I, when, I think of, when I think of things that are happening and right now, things showing up on the news, things showing up, Lord, uh, in, in, thing, in places around the world, and how accurate this Bible is, I stand in awe of thy word. There is nothing wrong with this Bible. There's nothing in error about it. Everything that it says is right and is true. Jesus himself declared it to be so. And Father, I pray, dear God, that you would increase our faith. And Father, that uh, as we just sang in the old songs, Lord, that uh, you would open up our eyes to your word and show us some marvelous things in your word. Show us just how real. And as the disciples, as they prayed to you, as they spoke to you, Jesus, they said, Lord, increase our faith. Lord, teach us some things. Lord, show us some things that we can carry, that we can carry on your ministry. Father, I pray to your God that you'd bless us tonight and bless your word, Lord. If we thank you, God, for Brother Don coming uh, all the way from Texas. Lord, I pray that you'd bless him 
in this, in this particular time of his life, and the many others, Lord, that we hope and pray will be traveling in uh, to see us this weekend. We pray, dear God, that you would just uh, give them traveling safety and mercy. Lord, Father, we look forward to meeting them again. We look forward, Father, to meeting people we've never seen before and uh, rejoining those, Lord, that have come in times past. We pray your blessings on your word tonight. We pray in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, amen. John chapter 17. Uh, yeah, there we go. John chapter 17. Let me uh, give you the context of this. Um, this Again, this is the prayer that Christ prayed uh, before uh, he is to go to the cross. He's in the Garden of Gethsemane and he's praying for his disciples. And there's a boy so much packed in here. Um, I was going through some old PowerPoints today and uh, some of them caught my eye and they were they were titled John chapter four. And they were from early 2022. <laughs> so we we've made it 13 chapters in almost a, in a year. So we're moving right along. Uh, look at verse uh, nine. Jesus says, I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. All mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. And I would just say to you tonight, just check your life. Check your life to make sure that in what you're doing, God is glorified in your life. That we're, it doesn't matter if you're alone. Doesn't matter if you're with people that know you. Doesn't matter if you're with strangers. Make sure that Christ is glorified in your life. And that after a while, if people get to know you, they, they'll know one thing about you. That you, that you are, that you believe the Word of God. That you believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior. I was talking to John last night, uh, about a man I used to work with. His name was Jim, Jim White. And I really liked Jim. I liked working with him. Uh, he was fun to work around. He was easy going. Um, he was lost. He had a lot of the world in him. He, he liked it. I never, I don't, I don't think he was a drunkard, but, uh, he never turned down alcohol that I knew of. And, uh, he kind of liked me a little bit, I guess. And, uh, it was during the time that I was working in construction that, uh, God gave, uh, Lisa and I our first church, and that was the uh, first Free Will Baptist Church down in Richwoods, Missouri. If you've ever been in Richwoods, that big A-frame church down there, that was, that was it. Pretty church. And, uh, God led us down there, and the night that I was going to be, uh, ordained as a minister, a preacher of the gospel, and as a pastor of that church, well, we're getting ready for the service. We're at the church. Service is about to get, begin, and here comes old Jim White into that church house. And I, boy, I mean, you could have hit me on the head with a two before. A bigger shock out of me than seeing him there. And I went over to a big smile on him and I hugged his neck. I said, Jim, what are you? I, I did. I kind of said, what are you doing here? Like, you don't belong here. You're, you're a sinner, you know. What, what are you doing here? And he said, I came to see, I came to see you because you, I had mentioned it to some guys at work that I was going to be ordained that, that Sunday night. And uh, he told me that some other people had asked him about it and uh, what he thought about it. And he said, I'm going. They said, what? He said, I'm going. He said, this is a big deal. So I don't know if you understand this. This is a big deal for a young man like that to be ordained. And, had, and I, I don't know what he was expecting. I don't know if he was expecting the Pope to show up or what. But uh, I, And I tried witnessing to him several times. I tried to talk to him about the Lord, and he was, like I said, he was real easy going. He never got mad at me, got upset. I never got upset with him. But he had it in his mind that he was going to heaven no matter what. And I, I don't know where he got the idea from. But as far as I know, he died lost. He died lost. But it was a situation, like what I'm telling you tonight, it was a situation where apparently... Without me really trying it, that Christ was being glorified in me at that age. I was, um, let's see, this would have been 1990. So I was like 24, 25 years old, somewhere around in there. And um, 
Apparently, there was something in me relating to Christ and glorifying Christ that impressed this older man to where he said, I'm going to go to this young preacher's ordination service. And he was there. And uh, I, I believe now he's dead. I think he's gone, gone out of this life and into the next one. I hope, I hope, in the times and years gone by that I have not seen him and did not keep up with him, that he gave his life to the Lord, but I, I don't know. I don't know. But you never know who you're reaching and who you're affecting in your life. You'll never understand till you get to heaven the people that you reach out to just by living the life you're living. Somebody say amen to that. All right, now, let me get down to where I'm going again. Uh, verse 10, all mine are thine and thine are mine and I'm glorified in them. Now verse 11, and now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world. And I come to thee, Holy Father, keep uh, through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. Now, I mentioned... I've, I went back uh, in, my, in the previous Wednesday night services and uh, I have already gone through this material. But I'm going to go through it again in, in a slightly different way. And that's the beauty of the Word of God. Is you can preach a hundred sermons out of one verse. In a row if you want to. If people have put up with it, you can preach a hundred sermons. Uh, and still not get everything that there is to get out of it. But something just hit me. Uh, this afternoon, and I guess it's probably because of the direction I'm going with the homecoming this year. Uh, we're going to be talking about some, some pretty serious things that are happening right, right this very moment. They're happening, all right? And uh, I mentioned that the Pope of Rome, and, and most popes, I wouldn't say all popes, but I would say most popes of the Roman church um, have taken on this title of Holy Father. They've taken a name to themselves that is a name of blasphemy because man is not God. Amen? Man is not that. Now the Mormons teach that as man is, God once was, and as God is, man will be. That's blasphemy. This here... For the Pope, or anybody else, to say that is blasphemy. He is, he is uh, taken, in, in, in my opinion, he's taken the name of the Lord in vain. Now, as I go through this again, I want you to think of not what is happening right now, or what has happened in the Church of Rome, but I want you to think prophetically. And think of, because there's a lot of different, a lot of different ideas of who Babylon is, um, who the Antichrist is going to be, and so on. There's a lot of people that believe that Babylon is the Catholic Church, and that the Pope is the Antichrist. And to that, I would say, yes, in a way, yes, absolutely. But are there not other things in this world that can equally qualify where you have a Babylonian type of system, whether it's uh, religious worship or it's politics or whatever it is, drunkenness or whatever, where you have that same thing going on and you have someone who is an all-knowing, all-powerful figurehead over that group and whatever he says goes. There are other organizations like that. If, uh, if you know anything about Freemasonry, you know that when you enter into the Blue Lodge, the first three degrees of the Blue Lodge, you are taught to submit and give obeisance and obedience to a man who is revealed to you by the name of Worshipful Master. That also is blasphemy. You don't bow down before another man and call him Master. And how people, men who are members of churches, uh, sometimes they sit on the trustee board, sometimes they're deacons, sometimes they're pastors of churches. Can go, walk into a Masonic lodge, kneel before that man, call him worshipful master. Or they themselves become the worshipful master of that lodge. How is it they can accept that title 
when Jesus said you can only have one master. Amen? One master. You, if you're, if you're going to have try to have two, it won't work. You're either going to love the one, hate the other, or despise the one and hold to the other. You, can, you cannot serve God and you cannot serve man or mammon at the same time. You cannot do it. So uh, what I want you to do is I want you to think of the Roman church as a placeholder for the mystery of, number one, what Babylon is, and number two, who the Antichrist is and who it will be. A placeholder. In other words, uh, they are rehearsing a scene that will take place in the future. Okay? If you know anything about Broadway plays, you know that the, the primary actors in a, in a well-funded Broadway play will have someone who shadows their uh, onstage performance. They have memorized the same lyrics that that person has memorized. What is that called? An understudy. Thank you. I, could, I was trying to remember it and was stalling long enough to figure, think I would think of it. But they have an understudy. And sometimes they will let the understudies go in and play the part that they're supposed to play to give them the practice and so on so that uh, when the main actor is ready, they can just walk out on the stage and boom, here it comes. Uh, who's ever... <laughs> I think their name is the Washington Senators. Huh? Washington Generals. Yep. The Washington Generals is the team hired to get beat by the Harlem Globetrotters every time they put on a show. How would you like to practice basketball your whole life and qualify to be the team that loses every game? Okay. Anyway, that's where I'm going with this. But, so let me read some of this again. The precedent for calling spiritual fathers father can be seen in one of St. Paul's letters where he refers to Onesimus, a converted slave, as, quote, his own true son, whom he begot. St. Paul is referring to his being a spiritual father to Onesimus, and this is very similar to our tradition of calling priests father. No, it's not. It's, they're making this up. They are generating for you a lie that they want you to believe comes from Scripture. But it doesn't. Because nowhere, nowhere, or Gospels, nowhere in the, in the letters that Paul wrote, nowhere in the seven letters to the seven churches that Jesus had John write and send out to them, did ever tell anyone to call anyone else in, in Christianity Father. Never, 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 never. In fact, Jesus said against that man, your father. So he says the Pope then becomes the Holy Father in his role as spiritual father, the entire cherishing the people and correcting us when necessary. Now remember, this man is the he's a member of the Washington General. He has a throne, a chair, a seat. Remember what the beast has in Revelation? The dragon gave him his power and his seat. A great authority in this world. Yes, he does. Yes, he does. Okay? And if, if I were to stand here tonight and break down the symbolism of the triple crown that he's and gesture is doing so on. Kind of going into detail of what all of this means. The bottom line is, whoever sits on the chair of Peter, what they refer to as the chair of Peter, they are the chief apostleship has been passed down through uh, whoever sits on that chair currently. Right now, it's Pope Francis. That he started calling him the moment that the 
immediately. Through one of those cards forward for him who's seated on the throne. Am I, have I lost my microphone? No. Check, one, two. All right. Let me set it down here. But anyway, bottom line is, this guy, his chair, his seat, his authority, everything about him is a placeholder for a mysterious person in the Bible who will be the, the Holy Father of all mankind whom God is going to turn over to a reprobate mind. He is the placeholder of the, uh, the strong delusion that's going to come on this earth to where people will believe a lie. When they talk about the Pope being the Holy Father, what they literally mean is they believe that he is God incarnate in this world right now he is equal to Jesus Christ. He is the vicar of Christ here on this earth, meaning that when he speaks ex cathedra, that means when he's, while he's sitting on his throne and he's in a particular uh, ritualistic manner, that when he speaks, he is as infallible and without error as the word of God itself. He has placed himself as an equal to the word of God. That to me just riles me up. Somebody say amen. Here it is, another one. The threefold confession of Peter is meant to counteract his earlier threefold denial. The first Vatican Council cited these verses in defining that Jesus, after his resurrection, gave Peter the jurisdiction of supreme shepherd and ruler over the whole flock. It didn't happen. This is the very reason why we call the Pope Holy Father. Because he was set apart to be the visible head of the church on earth a vicar of Christ whose authority and jurisdiction holds the entire church. Now, take your Bible, turn to Isaiah. What chapter am I going to... If I say Isaiah, nine times out of ten, what chapter am I going to? Fourteen. <laughs> yeah, Fourteen. Nine times out of ten. Isaiah 14. Watch it. Now, let me read this again. This is the very reason why we call the Pope Holy Father, because he was set apart to be the visible head of the church on earth. Excuse me. Does the Bible ever declare that a common man is to be the head of the church anywhere in scriptures? It's not there. Yeah. It's blasphemy is what it is. They've made a man into a God. In Isaiah 14, when you look at it, verse 12, this is exactly what Peter, what, what Peter, what Satan has in his heart. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my what? Look there on the screen. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Meaning, and what are the stars? They're the angels. I'm going to rule over the angelic realm. So in Revelation 12, what do you see happening? You have to have a war and, and get the angels to submit to the dragon. But it doesn't happen that way. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit, here it is right here. I will sit also upon the mount of the who? congregation in the sides of the north the mount of the congregation the congregation is the church it is the assembly of god's people and he vows in his heart i will not rest i will not cease i will not stop i i will not uh give up until i have placed myself in the seat over the congregation of God in the sides of the north. And in the sides of the north, I believe it means it's a reference to heaven. That's where God came from in Ezekiel chapter 1. So, um, again, this is the very reason why we call the Pope Heavenly Father, because he was set apart to be 
the visible head of the church on earth, a vicar of Christ whose authority and jurisdiction holds the entire church. So think of now this guy and whoever it is. I think this was Pope... Uh, Pope Pius, the one who signed a treaty with Adolf Hitler to not mess with the Vatican. In other words, we'll look the other way while you do all these horrible things, just don't mess with us. Okay? So Pope Pius, Pope John the 23rd, Pope Paul, Pope John Paul the 1st, Pope John Paul the 2nd, uh Pope um before Francis, Benedict and then Pope Francis. All of these men are acting out an understudy part. They are a placeholder for the real man of sin, the son of perdition who wants to sit in the mount of the congregation and rule over the very body of Jesus Christ, the church. This is why you've had such a hard day at certain times. This is why devils just climbed all over you. This is why they tried to destroy you, tried to destroy your testimony, tried to have you killed. This is why, okay? Uh, the Lord made St. Peter the visible foundation of the, his church. So here's what, I, here's what I want you to think of. I want you to think of now a beast rising up out of the sea. And great power is going to be given to him. And then as I'm reading this, and these are all things from Catholic sources. This is what they believe about why they call the Pope the Holy Father. Look at this now, not as it is currently, but look at how it will be. In other words, when the real, quote unquote, Holy Father, the beast, the son of perdition, the man of sin. How can you be the man of sin and the Holy Father simultaneously? Can't. Okay. So think of that. Think of it that way. The Lord made St. Peter the visible foundation of his church. He entrusted the keys of the church to him. No, he didn't. The bishop of the church of Rome, successor to St. Peter, is, quote, head of the college of bishops, the vicar of Christ, and pastor of the universal church on earth. The what kind of church? The universal church. Why didn't he just say the, the church on earth? Because that's all there is, right? Okay, let me finish this, okay? The church on earth. Why, didn't he, why did he say universal church? In fact, that's what the word Catholic means. Is it possible? Huh? Is it possible that there will be a religion, a religious event that will carry lost man into the heaven. Not the third heaven, the second heaven. And I believe there will be. I believe it. Okay? Now, now, now think of it. Because remember, uh, in Isaiah, he says, I want to sit on the mount of the congregation not in Jerusalem, but in the sides of the north. Way up there. Uh, some might question why we call the Pope the Holy Father. Catholic Answers tackles this question. Only God is holy by his very essence. However, by a person, place, or things association with God, it too can be called holy. That is so messed up. Uh, we met a, a young man. I, I called him a young man because last time I saw him, he graduated from our school years ago. His name was uh, Alan. And he was a um, Festus police officer. And then he changed uh, precincts. was up 
I think in uh, West County, and while he was on duty, he was in a horrible accident, just about killed him, and so he's had to retire early, but we met him, we saw him over at Walmart, and we were talking to him, and, um, you know, we were telling him about some of the things that we were doing uh, with our church ministry. He, him and his wife are going to a church now, and, and I'm, I'm glad to hear that. Uh, I have no idea why I was going that direction. That was pretty good for a while. Lord, bring it back to me in Jesus' name. Um, what was it? It had something to do with being called holy. Uh, things. Anyway, I'll probably remember it later. Only God is holy by his very essence. However, by a person, place, or thing's association with God, it too can be called holy. But that's not how it works. To be called holy is to express the idea of consecration, that someone or something belongs to God. That is why the Bible can call many persons, places, and things holy. And you know the Catholic Church. They can take this, Chris. Chris and Helen got me this so that my fan wouldn't blow my Bible verses away. They can believe that they can sprinkle that with holy water and say a few words and make the sign of the cross and use these fingers to do it and then now this becomes a holy object it's what they believe and so they believe then that if i'm wearing this on the day that i die because this is holy i now am holy and I have a plenary indulgence against all of my sins and I will not have to go to purgatory or at least I won't have to go there for very long because this holy thing that they said was holy is now touching my head. Okay? Anyway, uh, let's move on. Exodus 20, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Somebody say, Amen. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. So, we always quoted that verse whenever somebody around us said God's name in vain, like, oh my God, or God this, or God that, or something you hear in just about every movie that's out there, Jesus Christ. They use Jesus Christ in just about every movie now that's produced, there is they curse using the name of Jesus Christ to do it. And that bothers me. That bothers me. Okay? The Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. So, and I think rightfully so, that you ought not say the name of Jesus unless you are talking specifically about Jesus. And you're saying good things about Jesus, or you are praying to Jesus, or you're a witnessing of Jesus. But other than that, I wouldn't go around using his name about everything that happens. Um, Isaiah 14, we, I jumped ahead of myself there on that. But he said, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, and I will be like the Most High. And the Most High is, of course, God. And it is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. These three are, in fact, one. Isaiah 42, 8. I am the Lord. That is my name and my glory. So let's go. My glory will I not give to another. So let's go back to this, this thing that the Catholic Church said. To be called holy is to express the idea of consecration, that someone or something belongs to God. That is why the Bible can call many persons, places, and things holy. Um... A person, place, or thing's association with God, it too can be called holy. And yet God said, I will not give my glory to another. Remember in Isaiah, in uh, John 17, Jesus himself says something that if he's not God, then he's guilty of blasphemy. And I want you to remember this next time you're talking to somebody uh, about the Lord. And they, they out of, because this is what they've been taught, this is what they've been told, they've heard somebody say this, and it sounds like a good answer to them. And uh, the bottom line is, why wouldn't somebody want to go to heaven? Because someone wants to enjoy sin the rest of their life. But let me tell you something about sin. You don't enjoy it the rest of your life. You enjoy it for a while, the, the pleasures of sin for a season. 
But sin does not give long-term pleasure. It doesn't. Uh, if Roy were here tonight, Roy would come up here and say amen to the fact that when Roy started drinking, it felt good. But he got to an age in his life because he had drank so long that because he drinks and if he stops drinking, his body starts going into this phase that is probably a horrible thing to go through and that is detoxing from alcohol and he would give anything to take a drink it's not fun anymore that at that time is it you're trying to stay alive is what you, is what it feels like but anyway uh, that is my name my glory will I not give to another neither my praise to graven images and if well, I wish I had that little booklet down here. J.R. would tell you to go look for it, but 